Next on Startup, we're going to head to Royal Oak, Michigan to talk to Tawny, who started Pink Pump, a trendy boutique that's dressing fashionistas throughout the Midwest. Then we're going to swing by Milwaukee, Wisconsin to meet with Ian and Jason, who created New Walkie, a social media site that's helping young professionals connect with their city. And last, we stop in Chicago, Illinois to chat with Chastity, the founder of Urban Fit Clubs, a network that provides its members with access to a number of boutique fitness studios. All of this and more is next on Startup. The entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well. In Walsh College's business launch entrepreneurial community, consultants provide advice to aspiring business starters. More information available online. The Chevrolet Volt, an everyday electric car with gas for longer trips. The nature of things to come. Oh, Chevrolet, find new roads. American Express is proud to support startup and the millions of small businesses that put in the hard work to be open for business in neighborhoods across the country. My name is Gary Bredo, and I'm a documentary filmmaker and an entrepreneur. The economy is in less than perfect shape, and when the jobs go away, there's nothing left to do but get up and get creative. And there are people all over America doing just that. It's estimated that up to 85% of new businesses fail, so I'm going coast to coast to hear the personal stories of the people who beat the odds and started a successful business from the ground up. This is Startup. I'm on Main Street in Royal Oak, Michigan, and we're gonna go talk to Tawny, who created Pink Pump, along with several other stores. Now, Tawny learned at an early age from her mother that hard work really does pay off. Let's find out how she took this small idea and is on the fast track to becoming a global brand. Even with today's challenging economic climate, the retail industry has seen an increase in sales towards bolder, more high-end accessories to complement the growing interest in classic and more versatile apparel. Tawny, too, has always been tenacious and highly driven, and she made a decision early in her life that she was willing to do whatever it took to see her dreams come to fruition. The result is a highly successful retail chain with visions of becoming an international brand. I want to know about you as a person, uh, a little bit about you know your educational history and business. You've built quite, I would say, an empire here. I want to know who you are. Well, I um, am actually a lot like my mother, which is scary. My mother came here to this country in 1979, and she had $25 in her pocket. And she was a single parent, myself and two sisters. And she literally raised us, learned English, worked her way through school, and she did it all by herself. I'm book smart, but I'm street smart. And I learned a lot of that from my mom, because she was a hustler. She like hustled her way to get to this country, and she worked her way through college, and she's just like my idol. And I can attribute a lot of my business sense to her, even though she's not a business owner. She taught me everything I know. What were some of the hardships growing up that you can remember, if you could share maybe a personal story? I was the youngest and honestly I got all the hand-me-downs and it's really funny because growing up we didn't have money obviously and as soon as I was able to get a job I started working, babysitting, tutoring kids in the neighborhood, whatever I could do to earn a little bit of money. The things that I got teased about for not having are the things that I make a living on now. You're trying to prove something to the people that were I making fun of you? I would say so. I would say so. I think things like that really do affect you and you don't realize it until you're in adulthood. And it's really cool because you can channel that negativity and you can channel any challenges that come your way mm -hmm. and it's all about how what you make of it. Right, so you can let it cripple you or you can let it motivate you. Did you go to college? I did. I got my bachelor's degree and I graduated in um, 2002. And I opened my first business in 2005. My degree is in business marketing. And it's funny because people say, oh, well, you own a business because you have a degree in business. They didn't pull you aside in college and say, OK, this is what you do. You know, A lot of this was trial and error. What was your first job? Got a job for like two weeks in marketing, got fired, <laughs> and then you. went back into the salon business. I worked all through high school and college in a hair salon. And my mom says, what are you going to do? You're back where you started, but you have a degree. And I said, well, I'm really passionate about the hair business, and I would really like to start my own business. And she looked at me and said, I believe in you. And she was 
willing to put her money where her mouth was, she gave me her life savings. She said in hindsight, she didn't, she can't believe she did it, <laughs> but um, it worked out for the best. Sure. I actually started the salon with my brother-in-law, an amazing hairdresser. I found a location, started calling on it, um, kind of winged everything. And a year later, we were open. And it was a challenge. The first two years, it's all about trying to break even and try to get a feel for things and kind of find your own flow. I worked as much as I could. I worked during the day and I bartended at night. So sometimes I'd work like 18 hour days just to save up enough money to sustain myself personally as well as help contribute to the business in any area that I could. The second year after the salon opened, I got this crazy notion in my head that I was gonna open up a shoe store because I went to a couple of stores and I couldn't find a pair of shoes that I wanted. So I didn't even know what a line of credit was or a business loan, how it worked. Um, I went into the bank and I applied and I got denied. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, I need to find a way to get what I want. And if the bank can't give it to me, then I have to depend on myself. And I bought a rental property. It was a duplex. So I renovated it sold it, took the profits from that, dumped it into an account, and opened up my first store. But that store actually failed within a year, and I realized that either I'm gonna close and be done with it, or I'm gonna give it another try. I took the money that I had saved up and started another business, called it Pink Pump, and now I have a total of eight locations. In year five, we really started to see profits coming in, and things were going really great but unfortunately my brother-in-law passed away. It was kind of that turning point where I had to realize that this whole business was now on my shoulders. And I had people who worked for me that had families and they all depended on the business. And I really grew up at that point. I realized that this is no longer fun and games. This is real business. Men and women's casual dress shoes make up about 40% of the total shoe industry marketplace. 15% of that from men's, and 25% from the sale of women's shoes. First time shopping at Pink Pump? No, this is not my first time shopping at Pink Pump. I've actually been a faithful customer for about two years. Two years? Yeah. Why do you like it here so much? It's unique. Like, I used to shop at like big brand stores, mm -hmm. and then I realized that everybody wears the exact same thing. So, so you go out somewhere and it's like, you want to run because yeah. she's wearing the same dress or like, shoes or something. Like literally, that's actually happened to me before. Oh no. It was terrible, it was like a cheetah print mess. So, <laughs> I like the fact that at like Pink Pump they have stuff that's different and there's only like a couple items and once it's gone, it's gone. You're the only one who has it. So, unique. yeah, I like the unique factor about it. Paint the full picture for us of all of your businesses that are happening right now. Okay, so right now I have my hair salon, which is in Bloomfield Hills, and I have Pink Pump a couple doors down from the salon, also in Bloomfield Hills. Mm -hmm. In West Bloomfield, I have P2 by Pink Pump, which is a spin-off concept that I came up with a year and a half ago, about two years ago, that is the cheaper, trendier version of Pink Pump. We have my new business that I went into partnership with a couple of good friends from college, yeah. and we did a men's clothing store called 218. Accessories or just clothing, tennis uh, shoes as well? Everything, it's a men's lifestyle store. The annual number of US consumer footwear spending reached 20 billion in 2012. What do you have to say to that person, male or female, that's just starting out, they have a vision, they have a dream, nobody wants to give them any money? I tell people all the time who ask me, if you really want it, you have to find a way to get the money. Because at the end of the day, a dream is great, but you have to make that dream happen. Not everyone could walk a mile in Tawny's shoes. It's her unrelenting work ethic and personality that's not only putting Pink Pump on the map, but inspiring other area entrepreneurs to put their best foot forward. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for Pink Pump. I'm standing at the top of Reservoir Park, and what you see behind me is the canvas for a couple amazing startups. The canvas is Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and the startups are Art Milwaukee and New Milwaukee. We're gonna to talk to Jeremy and Ian and find out the details about this unique business model. Social networking sites are driven by the increasing desire to stay connected, and Americans are more technologically connected than ever. Although online networks are popular, Many professionals tend to prefer face-to-face -face networking because of the potential for higher quality and more personal relationships. Ian and Jason take a lot of pride in their city, and New Walkie's events have added a unique element to traditional networking. The organization helps welcome newcomers to the city 
as well as retain some of Milwaukee's best and brightest talent, allowing the city's business culture to grow and thrive. Explain uh, a little bit about uh, New Walkie and what it is that you're doing and why. To sum it up simply, we help people fall in love with their city. So if you just moved here or you've been here all your life, you go through different stages. You just graduated college, you just transitioned jobs, and there's a lot of young, like-minded people similar to yourself that are looking to get engaged, roll up their sleeves, do community work, or just expand on their social groups. Um, so New Walkie does over 150 events a year all throughout the community. Uh, we always pick a different place, so the motto is meet people, meet Milwaukee. So if you've been with us for a year, you've probably met you know, 5,000 people, um, you've grabbed a couple of really close friendships, and you've become an expert on your city. Has your organization been able to step in and, and touch base with, with the heads of these companies and get them to support your movement? A lot of HR people would spend lots of money recruiting someone, mm -hmm. but after they're here, what are you doing to keep them here? Where does that retention come in? Sure. We have no problem as a culture generation switching jobs after two years, but if that company invests in their employees, provides them a social outlet, um, opportunities to get involved. If you're volunteering in your community, you're far more likely to stay. So we've been very fortunate that Milwaukee, unfortunately or for, fortunately for us, it has a retention issues from time to time. A lot of people graduate from the universities, the first thing they think of is New York, Chicago, LA, I must get out to succeed, but that's not the case. So we're uh, right now we're in the lower level luxury suites or the basement of the Grand Avenue Mall. And uh, housed in here is New Milwaukee and Art Milwaukee. Okay. Um, both groups work to uh, kind of raise the perception of the city. So um, Art Milwaukee, let's talk about that. Art Milwaukee brings thousands of people together around an art experience. So New Milwaukee and Art Milwaukee work side by side. So we share staff, share space. Okay. Um, you know, New Milwaukee in itself is. Um, very specifically geared towards young professionals. Okay. We're Art Milwaukee, the common bond is art. So you might see five-year-olds or two-year-olds in a baby stroller up to 80-year-olds. Yeah. What's the business model? How do you get paid? How does this work as a business? Sure, so it's multifaceted. Um, most of our events are free, but occasionally we do uh, some paid events, so there's revenue there. Um, we also charge the venues whenever we're doing an event there, so they look at this as a great way to advertise. We're bringing 200 to 1,000 people to their business, we're talking about it, and then that business becomes cool and relevant, and everybody's taking photos, uploading them to social media, etc. How did you create this collective? And did you all just say, you know, I'm done with my day jobs, we're gonna do this full time? Well, so we, were, we started uh, New Milwaukee about four years ago. And okay. The first two years, it started growing and increasing in numbers, and pretty soon it reaches that tipping point, I'm sure, as many small businesses do, where you're either doing it full-time or you have to stop it. So um, myself, Jeremy, and Angela all jumped ship at the same time. I quit my uh, marketing job. Um, Jeremy worked for uh, one of the universities, and Angela had her, uh, her own consulting um, business as well. You know, How scary was it? It was it was terrifying. And trying to explain this to your parents. Oh, we're kind of this social movement <laughs> that's happening. Okay, whatever, kid. What's Facebook? Yeah, what's Facebook? What's a Twitter? Okay. So it it uh, you know we we really bootstrapped it for the first year and we didn't have any funding, any resources. You did it all out of pocket. All out of pocket um, for the first the first two years, and now it's it's starting to it's a new business model. It's strange yeah. to people. People are generally used to, um, when they want to get a message across, sure. it's buying a newspaper ad or um, an online banner. Traditional marketing. Traditional media. And this is something that's completely different. Mm -hmm. And it's really identifying what that business model will be. The party and event planner industry generates over $6 billion a year in revenue. How did, how did you guys meet and start to collaborate? Oh man, we met, I think I came to an event when we <clears> started <throat> in Milwaukee. Jerry stalked us. And I was doing awesome. some freelance stuff, trying to hand out the business card, doing the old networking <laughs> thing. Networking! <laughs> and uh, I, think, I think I bought you a drink and asked you on a date or something. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's how it went. Wow. But, uh, and then we just started talking and I think what we realized we had a lot of ideas that mm -hmm. were aligned and realized we wanted to change the city and realized it wasn't going to be to the people that were already doing it. It was going to be the next generation of people that made the change. There's so much more to Milwaukee than just the downtown area. 
Okay. So we're coming up right now on Water Street. Okay, Water Street, cool. Street Brewery. So another uh, microbrew? Yep. Indeed. So this is a college town. It's a, Yep. Most people think Madison in this state when they think yeah, college town. Yeah, that's what I think. It badgers. But actually, we have more college students uh, here in Milwaukee. Wow. So we're going to keep following this up to Brady Street. Brady Street is one of the most diverse areas in the community. Um, so you're going to have lots of patio culture. Um, Does you know, this bridge the cultural gap at all this street? Yeah, it definitely helps. This is the uh, Thai restaurant here. Um, Reganos. This is the only, well, what the one of the only bars in the city you can bring your dog into. I mean, I would have never even thought to venture out into this hip little community. Yep. But this is this is sweet. How big of a part does uh, does social media play in, in in what you do? Oh, it's huge. When you have someone coming to Milwaukee and they take a, when you're looking at branding of the city, they take a photo of their city, them in front of the art museum, and they say, I love this city. Mm -hmm. That goes out, that's the best branding in the world. That's better than yeah. buying that full page ad in the New York Times because no one cares. But if you have someone you know and like and trust and they're your yeah. friend and they're, te they're excited about the city you live in, you're going to want to go visit them. Right. You're going to want to go check out that you city. You believe it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it's much more genuine coming from someone's actual social media feed. The Wisconsin Department of Tourism had 1.7 million unique visitors in 2011. What would you say to other people that want to be ambassadors to their city and create a, a really unique, interesting new business that you've done? What, would, what advice would you have for them? I would say look at everything in your city when you drive by it, say what if, how can I, how can I change it? I would say look at everything as an opportunity and I guess I would say you have the ability to affect it and actually work through the problems and mm -hmm. look, look at a problem and try to change it. Communities grow from like-minded people with positive ideas. And Art Milwaukee and New Milwaukee are definitely setting an example for what it means to be the true ambassadors of your city. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for New Milwaukee. We're in the heart of downtown Chicago right now, and the next business that we're going to meet with is a woman named Charity Gonzalez. Now, just when you thought that every business, good business idea has been done, along comes somebody like Charity. She proves that you don't need a building, you don't need to sign a lease, you don't even need a ton of startup capital or anything like that. All you need is a really good idea and a passion for what you're doing, and you can start an amazing business. The fitness studio industry has grown to feature a number of multidisciplinary platforms in which clientele can seek out a workout more specific to their interests. Boutique studios generally employ a much smaller staff than fitness center chains and boast better access to experienced trainers. Charity Gonzalez was tired of the same old traditional gym routine and liked what boutique gyms had to offer, but having multiple boutique memberships was far too expensive. So she created an opportunity for people just like her to experience everything the Chicago fitness world had to offer for one manageable price. So the way it came about is I am a big fitness enthusiast, right? I consider myself, I would say, an urban fitness warrior. I, at some point, I was just bored with going to the same gym. I had kind of reached the top echelon. I'd been everywhere. So what I started to do was go into my neighborhoods. And there's all these very specialty boutique places that specialize in one thing. So True Harmony does yoga, Atlas CrossFit for CrossFit. Um, and so what I found at all these places is that the workouts were so much harder and the quality was so much better. Um, that was really, I was getting a better workout, I was cross training, I was doing all these interesting things I had never tried because it was different than what my gym had to offer. Right. But the problem was it was very inconvenient and really expensive. So yeah. to join all of these places, to get the, the same cross training I had at my gym being a boxing class, a spin class, a yoga class, I had to join like six gyms in discussing it with my friends who, you know, in the city, uh, I would say, you know, there's a lot of urban fitness warriors and yeah. w men or women who really want the best of the best and the quality and kind of the niche what the city has to offer is about the local places. Right. Um, so people were like, I would totally do that. So it really came from there and serving the need of how I wanted to work out. You know, my first step in it was really to go out into the marketplace and see how the gyms felt with what I had proposed to them. And it seemed that everyone was on board. So it was really just a step-by-step -step process of figuring out, um, you know, I just tried to focus on something different every day to kind of move the idea forward. Um, once I found that the marketplace and that I had an audience that was interested and I knew that the gyms were also interested in partnering, um, from there I could 
build the business. Tell me about your relationship with Urban Fit Clubs and how that all started. Yeah, so Charity approached us because um, we really fit into the Urban Fit Club, mm -hmm. the actual club, because we're a premium boutique gym in Chicago. And we're so happy to be a part of it. It's been a great experience for us. Do they get the same benefit as any of your members? Yeah, so if you're an Urban Fit Club member, you can come to any sort of class here. Right? We have classes all throughout the day. And I've done POW kickboxing. Um, I've done spin classes. I've done Shred 451. Um, sorry, Shred 415. Um, I've done Bar Method, uh, some yoga. Boutique fitness venues specialize in a variety of particular areas of fitness and deliver a more personalized experience to their members. Okay, you're not operating from a brick and mortar standpoint. Right. So since, since you do have sort of a virtual workplace, mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the expenses associated with starting a business like this? Because I can't really ask you about lease and I can't ask you about equipment <laughs> or anything. Right. What's, it, mean, what's associated with uh, this? Most of it, because it is an online business, most of my business was pumped into the back end of a website and okay. making an e-commerce site sure. um, that was built to house also a gym membership service. So really a lot of it went into technology. Okay. Um, and then secondly, most, uh, I would say marketing, because you know, th my purpose and what I do on behalf of all of the gyms, really I'm, I'm exposing people to the quality of going local and going to a local boutique gym versus sure. something that is more commercialized and um, you know, franchised in this big box space. Um, so mostly it's marketing and getting everyone's names out there, not just mine, but the community of these locally owned businesses. I had spent an entire summer at Starbucks writing things down of how it could work and right. Um, but until you put your money where your mouth is, you know, yeah. so at that moment I had my entire life savings um, and I could buy a condo and I could buy a car or I could invest in a business and, and rent and get around the city in a cab. So, right. you know, that was my decision and um, that's really, I would say, the, the standing on the edge point. So you, you forewent the condo and the car and put the money right. in, into Right, and a yourself. lot of other things, yes. <laughs> and a lot of other things. Okay. Yes. Wow, that's incredible. So with that significant investment that you made in the, in the website and the, the wheels that kind of drive this business, uh, are you profitable yet? Meaning, you know, have you paid yourself back and making money or where are you at um, with that? I have not paid myself back yet. I feel that I am on trend to hit those goals to what I kind of put you know, forth in a plan. According to entrepreneur.com, the startup cost for starting a fitness center ranges from $10,000 to $50,000. Factors like location, staff, marketing, and competition will determine the overall cost. In what way has it, has it affected your business specifically? We've got, to, we've got to promote ourselves to a wider audience. So we get people in here that aren't, don't even live in our neighborhood but hear about us through Urban Fit Club. And it's been a great exposure for us. Anything like that I think is a great idea, especially because we got, you know, like I said, we're kind of a, a specialized market. So right. if you kind of have something that people can try out these different things, I think that's a fantastic idea. There's a unique flavor for each gym that you go to. So it's a different experience every time you go work out. It's not the same people, same locker room, same yeah. treadmill, same weights. And so I think that makes you, um, I think that makes people that work out more enthusiastic and it keeps you working out longer. Charity, thank you so much for talking with me today. Thank you, uh, I'm extremely impressed with your business and really excited to see what happens in the future. Thank you. So it never ceases to amaze me, these incredible business ideas that people come up with. Charity exemplifies what it means to be a startup entrepreneur. Uh, to have an idea and not have the, the necessity for things like a building or whatever, she just did it. She took the bull by the horns and started an incredible business. You can do it too. For more information about Urban Fit Clubs, log on to our website and click their link. We'll see you next time. Consumers have been talking about companies forever, but it's really important that companies handle and understand how to handle responding to reviews and how to deal with that information. I think sometimes you know, people inherently don't like to be criticized but everybody's going to be criticized at one point or another. I mean, it's just part of being human. But it's really what you do when the chips are down that really tell about what your company's all about.
You want to do what you say you're going to do for your customers and you know, really work to delight them in the experience. You, know, you want to think about each opportunity you have to interact or to deliver product to your customers and make sure you're giving it your all. So when you read a review, never react to it right away. Go have a cup of coffee, go take a jog, do something else and then come back and thoughtfully respond because the way you respond can actually really help you win customers over. Next time on Startup, we head to Washington DC to meet with Ethel who created Doggy Wash Your Rat, a self-serve dog grooming service that caught the attention of the Washington Post. Then we swing by Chicago, Illinois to meet with Nick, the owner of Real Kitchen, the carry out restaurant concept that's taken all the work out of preparing a healthy and affordable meal. And last, we stop in Cleveland, Ohio to meet with Jason, who started Cleveland Art, a company that turns one man's trash into another man's treasure. Be sure to join us next time on Startup. Visit our website at startup-usa.com and like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. What, what, uh, what do you call organic food? What did they call organic food in 1950? No idea. Food. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. American Express is proud to support Startup and the millions of small businesses that put in the hard work to be open for business in neighborhoods across the country. The Chevrolet Volt, an everyday electric car with gas for longer trips. The nature of things to come. Oh, Chevrolet, find new roads. The entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well. In Walsh College's business launch entrepreneurial community, consultants provide advice to aspiring business starters. More information available online.